On Sunday night, we are studying the kings of Israel. And when I say the kings of Israel, we're talking about the books of the kings. When we think of the kings, we think of first and second kings. But the kings of Israel was more than that. The kings of Israel was the story of all the kings of Israel from 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel through 2 Chronicles. Now, you've got, you've got a relationship. You've got 1 first, first and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Kings, and you have 1 and 2 Chronicles. Now, the, uh, now the Jews did not call this uh, separate. They called it separate books, but they called it all the books of the kings. First and second Samuel was first and second kings. First and second kings was third kings and fourth kings. And Chronicles, the book of Chronicles, is a parallel view of some of the things that happens in first and second kings. Now, this is the time period that Israel came back from 40 years uh, in the wilderness and possessed the land. This is the land that was given to Abraham and his descendants. Of course, that was Isaac and Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. And then what looked like, what looked like, like that Israel was going to lose this promise was that when a new Pharaoh rose up that did not know Joseph, of course, Joseph was sold into uh, Egypt by his brothers. And when a new Pharaoh, J Joseph grew into great favor with the Pharaoh of Egypt because you remember the story how he had these dreams about the seven uh, fat kind or seven fat cattle going down into a river and seven lean cattle coming out. And when that was interpreted by Joseph himself uh, to the Pharaoh, he, was, he told the Pharaoh that seven good years followed by seven bad years and, of course, uh, the, the Pharaoh said, who better to put in charge of the, these good years so that we can get us through the lean years of the years of famine than Joseph himself? Who else would we do that? So they put Joseph in charge, and Joseph rose high in favor, and he became father to Pharaoh, the Scripture says, and he was second only to Pharaoh in all of Egypt. Well, uh, of course, that made Joseph highly favored, and he brought his father Jacob over to Egypt, and he set him up comfortably and his brothers. And then a new Pharaoh rose up that did not know Joseph, and that new Pharaoh watched as Israel grew and prospered and began to take over all of Egypt. Everywhere Israel's been, they seem to take over. Uh, God said, I'll bless them that bless you and curse them that curse you. So they took over and they started kind of taking over. So a new Pharaoh rises up and says, looks like these Jews are going to take over Egypt. We've got to do something. So they put them under taskmasters, under taskmasters, and they made them slaves and they ended up with this real bad reputation as slaves. They did not start off with that kind of reputation. They started off, the Pharaoh loving Joseph, they started off as being the most reputable people in the world because they saved Egypt through their leader, Joseph. Well, it was 400 years later that uh, a man named Moses, God calls Moses to lead them out of the wilderness, and they are 40 years in the wilderness, and they come back to the land that was given to Abraham, and when they come back to the land, they become a kingdom in these books of the kings. You had one exception there, the book of Judges, when they came back, God put them under judges because they refused to drive the people out who were unbelievers. Well, they come back to the land, and when they come into the land, 300 years they're under judges, 300 plus, and then they are under kings during this time period, and that is the books of the kings, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, and when you start with Adam, everything is looking toward the promises of God to his people. And the first time in the Bible that they become a people with an identity, with an ethnic identity, well, you wouldn't call it ethnic because ethnic is ethnos, and it means non-Jews. But when they had a Semitic identity, the first time they had a Semitic identity as a people 
was under the books of the kings, and of course, that starts in 1 Samuel, and when you go into 1 Samuel, that's the part where that uh, you see Samuel's father, Manoah, and his two wives, Peninnah and Hannah. One Peninnah has uh, an open womb, and she has children, and the other Hannah, her womb is dried up, and it reminds us a lot of Rebecca and, I mean, of uh, Leah and Rachel. Well, uh, of course, uh, Hannah prays to God and says, if you will give me a son, I'll give him back to you. And of course, by that second chapter, Samuel is born. And the book of Samuel, that's the first book of the kings. And by the time they get to the eighth chapter, there's been so much wickedness done by the sons of Eli, the high priest of Israel. Their names were Hophni and Phinehas. And they had laid at the gate of the temple with women and they were uh, involved in fornication. And then because of this, God uh, kills Eli, the high priest, even though he's a righteous man, he falls off of a, a log where he's sitting and he breaks his neck and he hears that the ark of the God is taken in battle by the, by the Philistines. And then uh, he's, uh, his two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, die in the battle. And things get so bad in Israel, Israel says in the 8th chapter, give us a man who's a king to rule over us. Looks like everything's always going wrong. The priests of God are always doing wrong. Give us a man. So God says, well, I'll give you a man. There in the ninth chapter, he finds a man taller than all the people in Israel. And his name is Saul. He, does, he comes from the wrong tribe. He comes from the tribe of Benjamin. So God appoints him king in the 10th chapter, and Saul never does anything right. He does everything wrong. By the 16th chapter, God says, go to the house of Jesse. I've chosen me a king among his sons. Samuel goes down there, and God has chosen David to be the king of Israel. And of course, David is from the right tribe. He's from the tribe of Judah, and the scepter will never depart from Judah, nor lawgiver from between his feet until shadow come. Well, then we've gone all the way through this book of First Samuel. I call this book of First Samuel the book of Saul and David because Saul is king in the eyes of the people until the 16th chapter. Then David is king in the eyes of God. Of course, in the, and, and Saul is the king in the eyes of the people. In the 17th chapter, David goes out, kills Goliath, and then the women begin to sing their great hymn. Saul has killed his thousands and David his ten thousands and, and the and the women, and Saul becomes so jealous. So by that 18th chapter, he's trying to kill David. He's using every little trick in the book to get David dead. I won't go through them. Uh, uh, just other than to say a couple of them was he put David ahead of his, his uh, personal bodyguard and put him into battle, hoping he'd get killed. And then he told him one time, I want you to go out and get 100 foreskins of the Philistines. And he just knew if he went out to do that, that he would die in the battle, and David brought back 200 foreskins of the Philistines. And then by that 19th chapter, Saul calls his son Jonathan in and says, Jonathan, David is trying to steal your throne. It's mine, and it's going to go to you, and I, I want his head. So he put, kind of puts a price on David's head in the 19th chapter, and all the way to that 31st chapter, we see Saul is trying to kill David other than a couple of points there where that Abishai, Abishai, the nephew of David, catches Saul uh, in, uh, David and Abishai catch Saul in a cave, and Abishai said, Uncle David, can we kill him? And David said, no, we're going to leave him alone. This is the Lord's anointed. Don't you bother him. And then another time, uh, God put them asleep. Uh, God put, called a strong sleep to come upon Saul, and Abishai says, this is our chance, Uncle David. Let's kill him now. And he says, no. This is the Lord's anointed. We won't touch him. Of course, by that 30th, by the 28th chapter, Saul is depressed. He's going up against the Philistines. He knows he's going to die, and he conjures up. He goes to the witch of Endor, and he wants the witch of Endor to conjure up Samuel because Samuel has been dead for two years, and Samuel is his only friend, his only hope. Saul has done a lot of evil up to this time, and of course, Samuel appears to him and says, no, and it's not the witch of Endor that conjured up Samuel. Don't ever believe that. It is God that conjured up Samuel. And Samuel comes and talks to Saul and says, tomorrow you'll be with me. 
Well, of course, that takes us to the end of 1 Samuel. That's the death of Saul there in the 31st chapter. And then we get into 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel is the book of David. I call that the book of David because that's, he becomes king of, of southern Judah in Hebron there by the second chapter. Hebron, that's the southern city in Israel in the second chapter of 2 Samuel. He becomes king of southern Judah, and there's a man that's still king of northern Israel. Does anybody remember who that is? Saul is dead. Abner. Abner. Abner sets himself up, and Abner is David's first cousin, but he was Saul's commanding general. And, of course, Abner knows that he, being a pretty good man, he knows he has no place on the throne, so he appoints the only surviving son of Saul to be the king of northern Israel. Who is that? Everyone it together. Ishbosheth. Yeah. Ishbosheth. Ishbosheth. And Ishbosheth was kind of a sissy, you know, just, just kind of a pansy. And he just, he didn't, uh, uh, Ishbosheth just kind of wasn't much of anything. He was just uh, kind of a puppet. And of course, Ishbosheth. He got angry at Abner. You remember why he got angry at Abner? <laughs> Abner. That's right. Abner took one of Saul's concubines, and the concubines went to the surviving king. There's only one problem. When you look at Abner and Ishbosheth, it's kind of like looking at Superman and a mouse, you know. And the mouse said, Now, you took one of my, my father's concubines, and that belongs to me. And, Ash, and Abner says, Listen, boy. It kind of reminds you of Foghorn Leghorn, you know. Now, I say, boy, I'm about to squish you with my foot. Because you don't talk to Abner like that. This man is a powerful general. And this pansy is... Those are my concubines now. And he said, son, I made you. I'm going to break you. And of course he did. Abner said, for that, I'm going to go give the kingdom to David. And David will be kingdom of all. And Abner knew that. Abner was probably a good man. Abner was certainly being Saul's commanding general. He was a lot better man than David's commanding general, wasn't he? <laughs> because who was, who was David's wacko commanding general? Is who? Joab, his, his crazy nephew, Joab. Murdering Joab. It had been better off to have Abner. And of course, Joab sees Abner go to David and he says, Uh huh, I think he's trying to trick me and he's trying to get my job. So he uh, comes up and. Uh, walks over to Abner, puts his arm around him, and says, uh, Hold my knife. Uh, thank you, Abner. And he gets rid of Abner. And then, of course, Ishbosheth is killed after that because his protector is gone. And some of David's men sneak in and kill Ishbosheth. And David has them killed because he says, You, you go in there and you kill an innocent man. You didn't fool with David, that's for sure. But anyway, and of course, we go through the book of 2 Samuel, and David has an affair with Bathsheba there and kills Uriah the Hittite, murders him there in the 11th chapter, and then from the 12th chapter on, his life is a living hell on earth. God said, God sent the prophet Nathan, and he said, the sword will never leave your house, David. And needless to say, the sword didn't leave his house because in that, in that 13th chapter, his, his son rapes his daughter, David's son rapes, David's son Amnon rapes his daughter Tamar. This is all David's family. David's son Amnon rapes his daughter Tamar. And then Absalom plots for two years to murder Amnon, his older brother, and he does. And then Absalom decides to take the kingdom from him. Take kingdom, and of course, needless to say, 
he runs David out of town, and then Joab catches Joab catches catches Absalom out in the wilderness one day when Absalom is coming out to attack, and Joab kills Absalom, and then he throws his body in a ditch and covers him up with rocks and says, "Let's get on with the fight." And it's like uh, this is like a biggest soap opera you can possibly imagine. Of course, we go through there and David goes through all his problems and we get to the end of 2 Samuel and we go into 1 Kings. Now, when you get into the Kings, in the book of the Kings, you're going, going to find an emphasis on prophets. Prophets in the book of the Kings, First and Second Kings. You'll find more emphasis on prophets than you will anywhere else. Then when you get into the book of Chronicles, and you have to look, when you get into Chronicles, you have to compare Chronicles with Kings because you're going to have some of the same accounts, but you're going to have some of these accounts where that, uh, where that you're going to say something in Chronicles that's not said in Kings, you're going to say some things in Kings that's not said in Chronicles. It's the same way with Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the Synoptic Gospels. So when you get into Chronicles, you're going to be dealing more with priests, priests than anywhere else, but you're going to be dealing with prophets in the book of the Kings. Well, we've gone through the book of 1 Kings. Uh, we started off 1 Kings, and Solomon was the king of Israel in 1 Kings. And uh, when we get to, he's the king of, excuse me, he's the king of all of Israel when we get, look here, let me just put this down. Let me erase this. When you start in the 1 Kings, Solomon is the king of all Israel. He is the son of David. Now, who is the king of Israel? Here we are. Solomon, king of Israel, beginning in 1 Kings. Now, when you get to the end of the book of 1 Kings, who's the king of Israel? Does anybody remember? Who's the king of Israel at the end of 1 Kings? Huh? At the end? You don't know. Uh, what happens in the 11th and 12th chapters of 1 Kings? What happens in the 11th and 12th chapters of 1 Kings? Give me a minute to read it. What happens in the 11th chapter of 1 Kings? Ah, thank you, Mike. <laughs> Strange women. Oh. Yes. 11th chapter of 1 Kings. 11th chapter of 1 Kings, Solomon. Solomon has 700 wives and 300 combines. I mean concubines. <laughs> 300 concubines, which were minor wives. What does God do in Due to that 11th chapter, when he allows these wives to keep their, their Shemash and Molech and Asheroth, tree gods and, and, fire, and fire gods and tree goddesses, what does God do? He splits the kingdom. He splits the kingdom. Well, wait a minute. What was my question a while ago? Who was the king of Israel? He splits it under Rehoboam, his son. Huh? Now, I didn't say, I said, who was the king of Israel at the end oh. of First Kings? Now, you've got to remember that. Wasn't it Ahaziah? No, at the end of First Kings. <laughs> what is the last chapter of First Kings? Huh? Huh? What's the what chapter is the last chapter of First Kings? Ahaziah, twenty three. Huh? Twenty two of First Kings. 
Zedekiah. Zedekiah. No, what are the, what's going on in the 22nd chapter of 1 Kings? Uh huh. What? What? You got Ahab. You've got Ahab that's been king. Ahab has been king of northern Israel, hasn't he? Who is king of southern Judah? Jehoshaphat is king of southern Judah because they go into battle together. And so when you get to the end, of course, you've got Ahaziah starts reigning in the place of Ahab, king of northern Israel. Now look here. Wait a minute. Right here. Ahab is killed in battle, isn't he? In the 22nd chapter, Ahab is killed in battle. So you, so you have to say Ahaziah... Ahaziah is the king of Israel, but the king of southern Judah is Jehoshaphat. And so Israel has been divided into two kingdoms. So that's kind of a tricky sounding question when I say, when I say the king of, at the beginning of 1 Kings is Solomon, who's the king, as though it was one at the end of the book. Well, it's two of them, isn't it? Because the king will, the true king will come from Judah, the southern kingdom. A false king will come from northern Israel, but it is northern Israel. And, the, and Ephraim is the head tribe of northern Israel. That's the second born son of Joseph. And he has the inheritance. So you've got to have Judah. You've got to have Judah. And you have to have Ephraim to have a legitimate kingdom of Israel. So you've got Ahaziah, king of northern Israel, Jehoshaphat, king of southern Judah, at the end of the book, right? And kind of remember these things. What are you laughing at? <laughs> That's kind of a tricky question, isn't it? So if I say, who is the king as though there was one king? Well, there were two kings, but one was legitimate and one is not because he's of the wrong tribe. So I always think, huh. End of 1 Kings. I think I'll go look at the last chapter. <laughs> now, we go into 2 Kings. The first chapter is about, we're talking about Elijah. We're coming down to the end of Elijah's life. When you begin, when you begin 2 Kings, the first chapter, I said something to Doug and some of the guys the other day. Uh, I said, one of the hard things to do when you're studying, study your Bible and try to remember where certain things are in the Bible. Try to remember, take some chapters of one of the Gospels and remember that, uh, that Jesus' lineage is in the first chapter of Matthew and that the angel comes to, to Joseph and Mary and, and, and a son will be born and and remember, the second chapter of Matthew is where Herod and the wise men come to him and they go to the house where he is. And then remember, the third chapter of Matthew is where Jesus is baptized in the Jordan and John makes his famous statement, I baptize you with water, but there comes one after me, I baptize the Holy Ghost in fire. And then remember, the fourth chapter is where Jesus is taken on a high mountain and seduced by Satan <coughs> and uh, and he comes out of the wilderness. And remember the fifth chapter is the beginning of the Beatitudes, which is the greatest sermon ever preached. It's called the Sermon on the Mount from the fifth chapter up through the seventh chapter. In the eighth chapter, you've got the, uh, you've got the uh, leper that comes in, uh, and you've, uh, you've got, uh, the, uh, you got the man that comes to Jesus and says, I'm a centurion, and I'm over so many men. And if you can kind of just get an idea of what's going on. What you're going to see here in chapter 1 and chapter 2, when you get to chapter 1, Elijah is the prophet in Israel, and he's got one and a half chapters to live when you start 2 Kings. He's going to die, well, not die in the sense of dying, but he's going to be carried out 
by a fiery, fiery chariot in the middle of the second chapter of 2 Kings, and he has a man who is going to follow on his heels, and that man's name is Elisha. But there's some things, be and we're getting into Elisha, there's some things about Elisha that I want you to know before we start. We went through the first chapter. Uh, Moab is rebelling against Israel after the death of Ahab. Ahaziah uh, falls down to the lattice in his upper chamber that was in Samaria and was sick. I want you to notice something here. Let me point something out to you. Let me point something out. That uh, Ahaziah falls down. If you'll notice over here, Jehoshaphat's still alive, and he's got a son named Jehoram, and Jehoram's got a son named Ahaziah. But this Ahaziah that we're talking about, remember we just got through saying, let me show you some points to, get, to show you how to remember. In the last chapter of 1 Kings, Ahaziah begins to reign over, uh, reign over Israel in Samaria. No, look, turn back over and let me show you this. Because when you're reading, you're going to have to differentiate between this Ahaziah over here in the left-hand column. He is an Ahaziah in Judah. You've got to differentiate between him and the Ahaziah over here. Now, this seems awful elementary, but I'm going to show you how you'd have to differentiate. There's an Ahaziah who's the son of Ahab. Don't get these two confused. It's like Jehoshaphat's running around with Ahab. Ahab has a son named Ahaziah, and Jehoram is influenced by his father's friendship with Ahab, so he probably names his son Ahaziah after, uh, after well, after his brother-in-law, right? Wouldn't this Ahaziah over here be brother-in-law to Jehoram? Would he? Then Jehoram married. He married Ahab's daughter, daughter. that heathen Athaliah. Right. Uh, he married Athaliah, the daughter of Ahab, and Ahaziah is the son of Ahab. So Jehoram is going to be brother in law to Ahaziah over here. And that's probably why he named his son Ahaziah, was after his brother in law, who he probably got along with because his sister was his wife. Right? Look at these guys. Now, it says that Ahab began to reign over Israel in Samaria. Samaria is northern Israel, isn't it? Right? Mm -hmm. Well, Ahab is the king of northern Israel. When you turn the page and you go over here, and it says Moab rebelled against Israel after the death of Ahab. Those are not just general words. Anytime after the split of the kingdom, when it says Israel, it's talking about northern Israel. And the context would say that Moab rebelled against northern Israel after the death of Ahab, the king of northern Israel. A lot of times I insert words so you can see it more clearly. Moab rebelled against northern Israel after the death of Ahab, king of northern Israel. And Ahaziah, who was the son of Ahab in the previous chapter, fell down through a lattice in his upper chamber that was in Samaria. This is the same Ahaziah that falls down through his lattice that's made king in the 51st chapter, 51st verse of the previous chapter, correct? Yeah. Then in other words, Moab is rebelling while Ahaziah is king. That's right. That yeah. Okay. While he's king and he falls down through some lattice work, some kind of probably network, not what we'd call lattice, but probably through some gate or something in the upper balcony in the upper chamber that was in Samaria. So that was in Samaria means this is the same Ahaziah that takes the place of his father and was sick, and he sent messengers and said unto them, Go inquire. Now, you remember. Let me show you something how to remember this. Remember when Jeroboam was king of of northern Israel because Rehoboam took bad advice from his, from his high school teenage friends and he set up golden calf worship to keep the people from going south and going back and joining Rehoboam. Therefore, all of the Levites 
left northern Israel, and there was no priesthood in northern Israel. So when Ahaziah, he sends and says, Go inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron. Why would a king of northern Israel inquire of a Philistine god? That's because they had no gods in northern Israel that they worshipped and believed in. They had no priests there. Whether I shall recover this disease. And of course, we know the story. We know how that Elijah, the Tishbite, the angel of the Lord said to Elijah, the Tishbite, go and go up to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria and say to them, isn't there a God in Israel that you don't have to go inquire of the Baals above the gods of Ekron? And then, of course, King Ahaziah sends messengers. He sends captains in their 50s to go to the mountain where that Elijah is residing. And he says, go up there and tell them, I demand that he come down and tell me, am I going to live? That's what Ahaziah is telling them. Well, gosh, here's a man on the verge of death making demands on a man that can call fire from heaven. Of course, the first captain in his 50s, a captain and 50 men that traveled with him was a sign of great authority among those people in that day and time. They would carry 50 men to put, not only to do the work of the king, but to protect the authority or the emissary that was going to make a demand on someone. And of course, we know the story how that the, the first man in his 50 went up to the mountain and said, we demand you come down. And uh, Elijah goes, God, uh, bring fire down from heaven. And all of a sudden, bzzz, and they turned into these like cartoon matchsticks, like nothing left but two little eyes and burn them up. And then, uh, and then of course, and then, of course, uh, King Ahaziah sends another captain in his 50s. Well, what does he have to lose? He's, he's going to stay up there in Samaria while he sends him down there to Elijah and says, I demand uh, you come and talk to me and tell me if I'm going to survive. And, of course, uh, the second captain in his 50s gets struck by these, and, you know, and they turn into little matchsticks too and nothing left. But can you picture those, uh, can you picture those, uh, I can picture 50 men just like a cartoon, just burn up. And yeah, just, fu just fizzles to nothing. I like to picture them as matchstick men just burnt completely to a crisp, and they're just sticks with eyes sticking out there, you know, left, you know. And, uh, of course, the third captain is sent by Ahaziah. These guys are thick heads, aren't they? <laughs> they got to be nuts. I wouldn't, I, and the third captain in his 50s knows what happens to the first captains, two captains in her 50s, and he goes up to them and says, Oh, my Lord, Elijah, please don't hit me with no fire. Uh, would you please, uh, whatever you want. My king told me to come here, but look, pay no attention to nothing, but whatever you want. <laughs> I just think that's funny. And, uh, of course, they were afraid of Elijah. What does that remind you of? Deuteronomy, the 18th chapter. If one thing that a man says does not come to pass and he calls himself a prophet, you do not have to be afraid of that man. Well, guess what? Everything this man said would come to pass. Not one thing he ever said did not come to pass. You must be petrified of Elijah. And they were. Isn't that unbelievable? They'd see some little old bow-legged guy and say, who is that? He's out there walking along, he's bald-headed, and he's just with a little old man alone. They say, shh, shh, that, that's Elijah. Don't tell him we're over. And what's amazing to me, they'd say, he's a man of God, and he can, uh, he can kill you. Now let's get back to our fighting. It's like, let's don't have him come over. He can solve everything, but let's fight each other and get this over with. I'm going, duh, what? What are they doing? Why don't they just call the guy over and say, we want to worship the living God, and you fix it. <sighs> Unbelievable. And, of course, the third captain in his 50s goes up there, and let's read that down there in 13th chapter, uh, 13th verse of the second chapter of Kings. 
and he's sitting in a captain of the third fifty with his fifty. And the third captain of the fifty went up and came and fell on his knees before Elijah and besought him and said unto him, O man of God, I pray thee, O great man of God that you are, let my life, please don't kill me. <laughs> it's my favorite Italian wine. Please don't kill me. <laughs> and the life of those 50 thy servants be precious in thy sight. Behold, there came fire down from heaven, burn up the two captains of the former 50s with their 50s. Therefore, let my life be now precious in thy sight. Notice what he didn't do. He didn't say, what about Ahaziah? He said, please don't kill me. He wasn't, that captain of those 50s wasn't that greatly interested in Ahaziah. He knew he wasn't going to get it out of his mouth if he started demanding that Elijah come down. He said, just first of all, please, oh great, oh great Elijah of the great God of Israel, please don't kill me. Uh, could I ask you a question? And the angel of the Lord said unto Elijah, go down with him and be not afraid of him. And he arose and went, be not afraid of him. I, mean, <laughs> I think that's a reverse, <laughs> you know. Be not afraid of him. And he arose and went down with him unto the king. And he said unto him, These saith the Lord, for as much as thou hast sent messengers to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, one of the cities of the Philistines, is it not because there is no god in Israel to, to inquire of his word, but nobody in northern Israel was worshiping Jehovah God? Therefore thou shalt not come down off that bed on which thou art gone up, but shalt surely die. So he died according to the word of the Lord, which Elijah had spoken. And Jehoram reigned in his stead. Now over here, look here. Northern Israel, you got an Ahab, Ahaziah, and Jehoram. Over here, you got Jehoshaphat, Jehoram, and Ahaziah. Both of these men probably named their children after their friends, after their brother-in-law. That's probably what they did. Ahaziah named his son after his friend and brother-in-law, Jehoram. And Jehoram named his son after his brother-in-law and friend, Ahaziah, son of Ahab. And Jehoram was son of Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat was always running around with Ahab. And Jehoshaphat was righteous, and Ahab was unrighteous. Now, once you get to understanding that, you start seeing it. Now, the rest of the Acts. Well, let's read 17, 18, chapter 2, chapter 1, 2 Kings. So he died according to the word of the Lord, which Elijah had spoken. And Jehoram reigned in his stead in the second year of Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat. So look here. These two Jehorams are reigning about the same time. You see? Jehoram, the son of Ahaziah, starts reigning in the second year. This Jehoram over here has been reigning in southern Judah. He's in his second year, 16 months, 18 months, I don't know. That's where they lose some of the chronology in the Bible when it just says in the second year. You can't say two years later. You can say it was 15, 16, 17, 18, 20 months. But these two Jehorams are reigning at the same time. One in southern Judah, the son of Jehoshaphat. One in northern Israel, the grandson of Ahab, the son of Ahaziah. So kind of watch these as you go along. And Jehoram reigned instead in the second year of Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, because he had no son. Now the rest of the acts of Ahaziah, which he did, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel? Now we're going into the second chapter of 2 Kings. Introduce. Not introduce, because we've already been introduced to Elisha. Elisha is going to take the place of Elijah. But I've got to back up to show you something on this. We've got to back up. This is where Elisha begins to come on the scene 
and stay on the scene. <coughs> but the first place we see Elisha, does anybody remember where? Elisha. Uh huh. Does anybody remember? Um, that was back where, uh, after Elijah had been on the mountain and, and he thought everything was all over, and God told him to go on the way, and he meets Elisha, doesn't he? Yeah, but what, where is that? Well, back there in Kings. <laughs> back in the 19th chapter of 1 Kings. The 19th chapter kind of remember the way these things are set down. When I'm talking these to, things to you, I'm kind of laying them down. We know that Elijah enters the world, he enters the scene, the world scene in the 17th chapter. Go back to 17, I'll just show you. Show you how to kind of remember this. In the 17th chapter, Verse 1, Elijah the Tishbite. That's the first words of this man Elijah in the Bible. Now, why would his name be mentioned? Because God's going to send him in this 17th chapter to say there'll be no rain because in the 16th chapter, verses 31, 32, and 33, Ahab marries Jezebel and brings grove and Baal worship into Israel. So always think of the last few verses of the 16th chapter of 1 Kings. That's where Christmas comes into Israel or Christ Mass or the same system that we call Baal worship that Constantine brought in in the 16th chapter. The whole purpose of Elijah coming on the scene is to declare no rain. That would be famine in northern Israel. <coughs> Ahab is consummating He's really consummating what Jeroboam started. All the Levites, all the priests of God have fled Israel. And the whole purpose, now just kind of notice, 16 is where Baal and Grove comes into Israel. 17, Elijah comes into Israel. He comes to uh, Ahab and Jezebel and says, there'll be no rain for three and a half years. You don't get the three and a half years there. You get the three and a half years over there in James, the fifth chapter. Then you get, then he goes to the brook Kareth. Ravens feed him bread and flesh in the morning, bread and flesh in the evening, verse 6. Now he's, he's hiding Ahab and Jezebel. Bring Baal in the grove into Israel, 16. He pronounces no rain and then goes, hides in a cave and for two and a half years, and the rest of this chapter, he goes up in the very shadow of the palace of the king of Tyre, the prince of Tyre, the father of Jezebel, or the king of Sidon, and, and uh, lives with a little widow little woman and her son. And then in the 18th, he said there's no rain in Israel. Well, you got to remember, through these following chapters, until you get to the rain coming back, Jezebel is angry. You get into the 18th chapter, and, Eli and the Lord tells Elijah to come out of hiding, and he comes out, and he meets a prophet named Obadiah, and Obadiah is a righteous man, and he works in the palace of Ahab, and, and he tells this 18th chapter is where that Ahab, t uh, excuse me, Elijah tells Obadiah, go get Ahab and bring him here. When he brings him to him, and this is where Ahab and Elijah meet for the first time. This is where they meet for the first time after Elijah stood before his court uh, some three and a half years before and told him there'll be no rain. And then the famous words of Ahab in verse 17, it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? Uh, Ahab is telling Elijah that he's troubling Israel. And of course, Elijah's famous answer in verse 18, he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, you've gone after Baal in the grove. It's God that said there'll be no rain. And then of course, this 18th chapter is the famous chapter. You got chapter 16, enter Baal in the grove into Israel by Jezebel marrying Ahab. 17th chapter, no rain, Elijah declares. 
He comes out of hiding after three and a half years in the 18th chapter, and he meets, he meets Ahab, and he says, let's me and you have a contest. The 18th chapter is the famous contest between Elijah and the priests of Baal, uh, the emissaries of Jezebel in Ahab. He said, let's let the God that answers by fire. In the last half of this chapter, this is three and a half years later, so you can remember that I've told you all before, when I remember things, I remember things in uh, like itemized list. I can't think of the 16th chapter of 1 Kings without thinking the very last few verses Jezebel marries Ahab and brings Christ's mass or Baal in the grove in Israel. And I can't think of that without saying God is going to bring them famine, no rain, beginning by the prophet Elijah in the 17th chapter. And he's going to hide all through that 17th chapter. The 18th chapter, he's coming out of three and a half. The, the 17th chapter is three and a half years of hiding. Can you understand that? Three and a half years of hiding. The 18th chapter, he's coming out of hiding. He demands to see Ahab and says, I want to meet your prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel, and I want to have a contest. And the God that answers by fire, he'll be the fire God. Well, at the end of this chapter, after Elijah makes fun of the priests of Baal, after they jump up and down and look like a bunch of idiots on the altar of Baal and cut themselves, and Elijah puts, this is all in the 18th chapter. Think of the great contest between Ahab's prophets of Baal and Elijah as the 18th chapter. The great contest, chapter 18. That's where Elijah that evening pours out. He digs a trench around the altar of God, sets up a new sacrifice, pours water, four buckets of water, big pails of water, four more, four more, and then he prays this little short prayer and God licks it up. This all happens in the 18th chapter. And then, of course, he says, he says, kill all the prophets of Baal. So in the 18th chapter, you've got Elijah demanding of Obadiah to see Ahab. He, de he challenges him to a contest to who the real God is. They kill the priests of Baal at the end of this. And then Elijah tells Ahab to hurry up and get down from here because I hear a sound of abundance of rain in verse 41. And he said, you better get back to Jezebel and tell her what I've done. Well, the 19th chapter is, a, is, is Elijah running for his life. So remember, 16, the entrance of Baal and the grove in Israel at the hand of Jezebel and Ahab. 17, three and a half years, Elijah stays hidden. Two and a half in a cave and one in the house with the elder woman up there in Tyre. Chapter 18, the big contest. And at the end of that contest, God wins and he rains fire from heaven and Elijah kills all the prophets of Baal and he tells Ahab, you better get off the mountain. Rain's coming. It's been three and a half years. And then chapter 19, chapter 19 Eli, uh, Ahab goes back to Jezebel and said, let me tell you what Ahab has done to your 450 prophets of Baal. And Ahab takes off running for his life. When you're, at the, when you're in the 18th chapter... Elijah takes off running for his Elijah, life. Elijah, is that what I said? You said Ahab. Oh, <laughs> Ahab better run for his life. He's running for his life in the 22nd chapter. <laughs> All right. Now, in that 19th chapter, here is, here's what's happening. Up here in northern Israel, around Jezreel, up here, this is where, somewhere in this neighborhood right here, don't have it on this map, this is where Elijah is in the 18th chapter. This is after three and a half years, and he's having the contest with the priests of Baal. Then when you get to the 19th chapter, he takes off running for his life and runs all the way through northern Israel down into southern Judah and gets down here into the Negev Desert right down here. And he's Negev or Negev. And he's running for his life and he sits down under a juniper tree and he knows this wicked evil woman Jezebel wants his life. 
And he says in verse 4, It is enough, God, I've had all I can take. Kill me. And God said no. He feeds him with angels. He sends some miracles to him, feeds him, says get on down into the desert, and he sends him down here into Sinai where Moses got the, got the law. Well, Jezebel ain't down here. Some of the fear has to be gone. And so this 19th chapter, the Lord takes him down there in the same mountain where Moses received the law of God, and God sends a wind, and he sends an earthquake, and he sends a great fire, and he shakes the earth. And he said, this is not how I'm going to come to you and do some great, I'm not going to send you to big Colosseum so you can have great big uh, gospel meetings. He said, it will be a still, small voice. I've got three men I need you to anoint. And that's what I think of when this chapter comes. He says, Jezebel's after me. You can put these down. Jezebel's after me. That's Ahab talking. Ahab, Elijah talking. It is enough, God. That's Elijah talking. God takes him down into the desert, and God says, no, it'll be a still, small voice. I think of these points when I think of this chapter. And then when you get up here, God... And then the fourth thing here, in verse 15, this is where we introduce Elisha. God says, I've got to bring about... Now, if you look here, let's read 15. And the Lord said unto him, unto Elijah, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when thou comest, anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. Because later on in 2 Kings, because northern Israel has no gods, they have just polluted themselves and apostatized completely away from God, God is going to take a Syrian king by the name of Hazael and attack Israel and bring them close to annihilation. She said, I need you to anoint Hazael. This is the still small voice. It's not some great earth-moving situation that Elijah has to do. When you think your life is over, God says, shh, I got some things. I want you to go over and whisper this man's ear. I'm going to need him to stir some things up. Anoint Hazael, king over Syria, number one. Wait a minute, let me write that down. This is what I think of, H-A-Z-A-E-L, H-A-Z-A-E-L, number one. This is the still, small voice, not some earth-shaking thing. Just go anoint Hazael as king over Syria, king over Syria. Now, number two, number two. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, Jehu, Jehu is going to be general of northern Israel, but he's going to be king over northern Israel because I need him to go kill Jezebel. To kill Jezebel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Mahola, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in your place, in thy room. We need you to anoint, number three, this is chapter 19, <coughs> Elisha, prophet in your place. Now, that would be a still, small voice. Now, do you think when he meets Elisha in the second chapter of 2 Kings, he's not aware of this? He's completely aware of this, that this is going to be the man who takes his place, and it looks somewhat like he's kind of halfway shunning Elisha, saying, wait here, boy. But it was more of a test than anything else. Now, let's read a little bit 
about Elisha, the son of Shaphat of Abel-Maholah, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in your place or in your room. Abel-Maholah, when you want to know about where these cities are, pick up your McClinic and Strong and look it up. Abel-Maholah, let me just read to you here. It was the birthplace or residence of Elisha the prophet and lay not far from Bethshean, according to Eusebius, in the plain of Jordan. It was in the plain of Jordan. Here's the plain of Jordan here, here and up here. Somewhere in this neighborhood here, Abel Mahola. It was close to Jordan. It was 16 Roman miles south, probably the same with the village of Belmea mentioned by Jerome, Eusebius uh, says it was situated between Sethopolis and Neapolis, or Shechem. It is also alluded to by Epiphanius, whose text had uh, rendered it another city, and they say wrongly locates it in the tribe of Reuben. And they go through here and tell you where they think it is proper, approximately. It was probably situated not far from the way to El Ma Mala emerges into the Alon or the Valley of Jordan, perhaps at the ruins of the now called Kerbek Eshunk, which was which are on the indolating plain beside a stream. This appears to agree with the conjectural location assigned by Swartz, although the places he names do not occur on any map. So they don't really know where it is. They just know it's somewhere in the Jordan Plain. And it's somewhere in, among these tribes, close to it, the tribe of Issachar and the tribe of Manasseh. Well, why are you saying that, Jim? Because we have no idea who Elisha was. We know he's a Tishbite, but we don't know who Tishbites are. We know that they may have come from over here uh, east of the Jordan River, and they may be Arabs. Elisha was a Jew. It's what he was. We know exactly who Elisha was. We know that he was a man of Israel. Let's read just a little bit about him here. Just a little bit. Here in chapter 19. And it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Hazael shall Jehu slay, and him that escapeth from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed the knee to Baal. And this is an answer to Elijah when he says, I even, I only am left, and they seek my life to take it away in verse 14. And God says, I've got me 7,000 in Israel that haven't bowed the knee to Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. So, or hath not kissed Baal, so he departed thence and found Elisha. Do you think he knows who he is? God said he's going to take your place, Elijah. He's going to be my main man in Israel. <laughs> is that humbling? You see, Elijah was ready to die in verse 4 because he said he didn't have any friends. God's about to send him a friend like no other friend he has ever had in his life. He's going to send a man named Elisha that will not forsake him regardless of the cost. Elijah will stand with him to the death. He will stand with him at death. So he departed thence and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him. And he with the 12... And Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him. The mantle was the outer garment. Among prophets, that was a coat of either camel's hair or sheep's wool. That was the coat of a shepherd. What he was saying when he cast his mantle upon him, he was saying, it was kind of like a, some Baptist preacher taking his suit off and pitching it to guys guy saying, now the job's yours except that ain't much of a job in a Baptist church. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah. This is Elisha. And said, Let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother, and then will I follow thee. Now, this is not the same words 
as we're finding uh, when the man said, let me go bury my father. He's saying, merely let me say goodbye. And he said it to him, go back again. Go on back. Go what you want to do. And he's testing Elisha. He's not saying, go away from me. For what have I done to thee? And he returned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and took a yoke and slew them and boiled them, their flesh with instruments of oxen and gave unto the people and they did eat. Then he arose and went after Elijah and became his servant. He ministered to him. Now, there's something amazing here because... Elisha was the son of a nobleman. I've got a book here. We're just going into Elijah and Elisha. This is written by Alfred Edersheim. I've had this for years and I haven't gotten into it. I just pick it up and read it from time to time. This is practical truths about Elisha. And I, I couldn't understand why he wrote this the way he wrote it. I thought, why Elisha and why not Elijah? I believe Elisha has, I believe we can identify more with Elisha in what we ought to be doing than Elijah. God came down on Elijah and just gave him this tremendous, wonderful, powerful ability to withstand the world. But Elisha was the son of a nobleman. He didn't have to be plowing the field. He was waiting on God to use him. Let me read let me read some excerpts out of this. This is this is one of the best books as far as practical daily living for the believer I've ever read. I mean I have ever read. I, and I've read a lot of stuff to y'all. This is practical truths from Elisha. And usually when we read Mr. Edersheim, usually we're reading about facts and and sayings and idioms and metaphors in Jewish culture and history. You can tell this man Edersheim is a true preacher of God when you read this because he sees things. It's just utterly amazing. First of all, as he moves into going into Elisha, he says, King Ahab presented a strange combination of incongruous elements. Undoubtedly, he knew and in a certain sense believed the revelation of Jehovah. That's because he didn't, the reason we believe that is because he wouldn't kill Elijah when he'd catch him. His wife wanted to kill him. He was always afraid of him. He was afraid of Micaiah. Remember that? Before he went into battle and Jehoshaphat said, let's find a man of God. And Jehoshaphat said, here's a man of God, Micaiah and Elijah. And Ahab said, oh, I don't want to talk to him. He never says anything good about me. And of course, the spirit from the Lord, one of the spirits from the Lord said, I'll go and be in a evil spirit in the mouth of one of his prophets to get him to go into battle. And, and then, then they come to Micaiah and, and Ahab says, go ahead, go ahead and say what you want to say. What's going to happen if I go into battle? And Micaiah said, if you go into battle, Israel will be like a, she, like a flock of sheep without a shepherd. You're going to die. He, he said... Jehoshaphat, I told you he didn't say good things about me, but if he had really been as evil, if he had no regard for God, he would have killed the man. But instead, he's always backing up, going, ooh. It's as though he had some regard for who God was. He always fell back, first in irresoluteness and then into his old sins. Like most weak people, he seemed lacking in capacity for solid principle in conviction of any kind. But true religion he knew not. He remained all of his life long the ready tool in the hands of his wife Jezebel. Whatever she wanted to do is what he would do. She was the daughter of Ethbaal who had succeeded to the throne of Sidon by the murder of his predecessor who combined with the royalty the chief priesthood of Ashtart. Never perhaps did a single individual exercise a wider or more pernicious influence. She flattered the weakness and indulged the unrestrained selfishness of Ahab. He was a selfish man. He wanted that, that lot beside his land as a garden of herbs that belonged to Naboth. And Naboth said, I cannot sin against my God. 
Queen Jezebel hated the religion of Jehovah. One of the object of her, objects of her life seems to have been to uproot his worship from the land, and she did. God unexpectedly sent unexpected help. By arousing his people to realize in conviction that Jehovah was the living and true God, that he reigned like one of the eastern torrents which burst with impetuous rush from the mountainside. Elijah the Tishbite descended from his mountain wilds, discharged his mission, and again disappeared after laying upon the land and the people three and a half years' curse of utter barrenness and desolation. Equally unexpected was his return at the close of that period. At the gathering on Mount Carmel, the question as between Jehovah and Baal was publicly answered by the nation. Evidently, the object of Elijah's mission had been to startle by its suddenness and by exhibiting, by exhibiting the unlimited power of God. That was Elijah's job, to do these magnificent things, to prove that Jehovah, he is God. And with this corresponds his very name, Elijah, whether we render it Jehovah is God or the strength of Jehovah, such being its purpose the mission of Elijah like that of John the Baptist. Every scene on the Mount Carmel where he faced these 450 prophets of Baal there in the 18th chapter made no salutatory, salutary impression upon Jezebel. Perhaps she regarded the God of Israel as only one of many national deities. Now listen to this. And Elijah as a magician more powerful than her priests. The triumph of this God and the ascendancy of his prophet only increased the intensity of her hatred. Listen to this sentence. I'm afraid this is America. Religion was to her a matter not of absolute truth or the opposite, but a question between national deities just as in our day, many regard all religions as substantially the same, the difference in their opinion lying in the greater or less earnestness, devotedness, and influence of the worshipers. He's saying she thought they were all the same. It just depended on how devoted and how earnest you were about what you believe as long as you are sincere. That's what, that's what Edersheim is saying. That's probably what she felt, just as long as you are sincere. And let me read this that I read a couple of weeks ago. And this hit me here when I read it. In bitterness and desolateness, he pursued his lonely flight to ancient Beersheba, speaking of Elijah, the southernmost border of the land. That's when he's running for his life. He starts running, and he comes down here, and he comes south, and he's running away from Jezebel, and he runs all the way down there without a sign from God or a companion among men. He is alone. Have you ever felt alone? You haven't been that alone. He must, I think Martin Luther may have known what he felt. Martin Luther had all of Germany against him, but he did have some friends cheering for him. Elijah had no man, no one. Why was he doing this? Why was Elijah doing what he was doing, staying lonely and distressed and disturbed? Why? No. It's not why he's doing it. But first of all, he wanted to die. Why was Elijah doing what he was doing? Huh? What'd you say? That's it. <laughs> That's it. It was his duty. You think he's having fun when he says, it is enough? Kill me, take me out of here. God sent him. That's why we're supposed to do what we're supposed to do. It has nothing to do with how we feel. Well, I feel like partying. I want to take off today. And I well, I don't care what you want. Don't tell me that. I would rather someone would say, I want to party rather than I think I deserve time off. Well, tell God that. 
But God, listen to this, God could not and would not forsake his servant. He sent an angel to feed him. There was no one there, no one to take care of Elijah. He assured him of his presence and help by miraculous provision. Remember, he had an angel prepare food for him. The Lord will deliver and sustain. That was in that 19th chapter, you remember? The Lord will deliver and sustain. Listen to this. And boy, if we don't get anything, get this. When you're going through hard times, the Lord will deliver and sustain, but only for further duty. God will pick you up when you're down, when you're falling to pieces in order for you to go to further duty. I've got some, I've got some still small voice I want to put in your ear. Go down here and anoint these three people. I'll tell you when your work is over. It may be a further trial. Let me read that again, and let me change that or Simon's words. That's the only, that's, I'll disagree with him in a few places. Let me read that. The Lord will deliver and sustain, but only for further d duty, and it will always be for further trial. Not maybe, always. Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. The word strange is X. E-N-I-Z-O, it comes from X-E-N-O-S, and that means a stranger, an occasional guest. That's not an occasional guest. If God sustains you, it will be to put you into more trial. Onward must the prophet press by unfrequented paths and lonely byways till he reaches Horeb, the Mount of God, or Sinai. He has to go forward till he gets down there to meet God. He was alone. He had no one until he met Elisha. And he had a man that wouldn't leave him for nothing. And this was a nobleman's son. And this man didn't have any reason to be out there in the middle of a desert somewhere following along with some nut that the world hated. Name was Jim Brown. <laughs> you have no reason to follow a crazy man. Jezebel and Baal cannot triumph. They can't. I like what he says, Jezebel and Baal. He didn't say Jezebel and Ahab. Jezebel and Baal cannot triumph. The storm of wrath shall burst upon an apostate race. Hazael is to be appointed king of Syria and Jehu king of Israel. This is judgment, this in judgment, but in his kindness has the Lord called Elisha, the son of Shaphat, to be a true yoke fellow to Elijah. He was so depressed. In compassion only, the last of these commissions is to be discharged by the aged prophet himself. As for the mission of Elijah, that of preparation for judgment and mercy, it is drawing to a close. He is about to go out to be with God, and when Elisha gets to get in this long, deep rut and stay in it until he dies, do you really want to be a preacher? Do you think I am happy all the time? I have a desire, I have a shepherd's heart. It's the most heartbreaking thing I've ever been in my life. I have my friends turn away, I have people walk away from me, and all I'm doing is loving them and trying to teach them, and they know more about the Bible than I do, and probably they do, but let me tell you something. It's not how much you know about the Bible and how many Greek words you can look up. That has nothing to do with whether you've got a preacher's heart. A shepherd's heart, you've got to look at the sheep and you've got to not respect and this one's jumping up and down and this one's real nervous and this one looks like it doesn't have any personality. Has any of y'all seen me jump from one person to the other here on Sunday morning? I'll say, oh, there, i got to go talk to that one. He, Huck, wait a minute, this one over here is having problems and I'm running around hugging everybody. I just feel a total obligation to get around and see everybody. Enter Elisha. Upwards, Elijah traveled along the fertile valley of the Jordan, signs of life and happiness multiplying, till he reached the well-known district of Abel-Mahola. 
Here the eye of the prophet rested on a busy scene. Twelve yoke of oxen were plowing up the ground, eleven in charge of hired servants, and the twelfth guided by the master's son, Elisha. He didn't have to be there. He was a man of nobility. Whithersoever he looked, all was the property of one man, and he a true Israelite. These are the fields, and this is the cattle of Shaphat. These men are Shaphat's servants, and this is his son Elisha. He doesn't have to do something this menial. And why would a man want to leave this kind of substance and this kind of inheritance to become a hated man following a crazy man like Elijah? Whom the prophet had come to call to the service of the Lord. Better preparations of greater suitableness for the work could scarcely have been found than Elisha, the son of a godly household his was the ancient faith of Israel. The times were sadly degenerate. Why is that? Because they haven't had any prophets in northern Israel or any priests. They haven't had anybody in northern Israel, hadn't had anybody up here for generations because Jeroboam has brought in golden calf and no one, and they have run off all the Levites and the priests of God the son of a godly household. The times were sadly degenerate, but even in the capital there were uncompromising Naboths. Do you realize that Naboth, the righteous man of God, lived right in the shadow of Ahab and there was no priest in northern Israel? And Naboth, a man of God, was willing to stand up in a heathen land for what was right and godly. Naboth probably knew his death was coming. And at court, devout, though perhaps weak Obadiah, as you remember Obadiah is the one there in the 19th chapter, or in the 18th chapter, he said, go find Ahab. And Obadiah said, oh, but I've hid prophets of Baal, I've hid prophets of God by fifties in caves, and if you leave from here, Master Elijah, and he are not here when Ahab comes, he will kill me. And Elijah said, go get him, Obadiah. So there were some weak Obadiahs in the land too. Undoubtedly, Shaphat and his son were among the 7,000 faithful witnesses in Israel that had never bowed the knee to Baal. Isn't that great to stop and think of that? Let me give you some of the characteristics of Elisha. How much time do I have, Mike? L listen, here are characteristics of this man, Elisha. A marked characteristic of Elisha was contentment with his position. Young man, I want you to listen to this. Contentment with his position and willingness to fulfill its duties, however humble. His whole history shows him to have been distinguished by natural gifts, by strength of character, possession of divine grace, talking about Elisha, his outward circumstances, this is what he was outwardly, and to show you how willing he was to give it all up. His outward circumstances were those of wealth and influence, yet though in a manner born to rule, that's what Elisha was, he was a man of nobility, born to rule. He was willing to serve. Born to rule, but willing to humble himself and serve, that so he might serve his God. He was willing to give up everything. He plied his humble avocation, waiting. I like that. Waiting till God, if he pleased, called him to a higher and more prominent place. I was in a hurry when I was a young preacher to get somewhere and be somebody important. And all I did was spin my wheels for about 15 or 20 years. 
getting nowhere because I was unwilling to wait and study the Word. Men's estimate, listen to this, and this is always young men because it makes me want to crawl under the floor when I read this. Men's estimate of themselves is generally in, in, in the inverse ratio of their qualifications. Men estimate themselves a lot higher than they're qualified. How few possessed of gifts are willing to wait the call of God like Elisha did. He waited, and yet he was wealthy, and yet he was positioned and born to rule, and he could have stood up and said, I'm born to rule. But instead, he waited on God. Huh? Isn't it? This is when men think they are something on me. What does the Bible say that? Doesn't it say that? Look over here in Galatians. See, Elijah didn't think about himself. Watch out that we don't get caught up in pride thinking, I am something, I'm learning, I'm learning fast, I'm getting a hold. It takes more patience to be a shepherd and follow like Elisha did. It takes more patience than anything else. And patience comes with many years. Look here in Galatians. Galatians, the sixth chapter, and this is the way Elisha felt. Galatians, the sixth chapter, verse 3, For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. We don't know what we are. We're nothing. And doesn't the Bible say that over and over, that we're nothing? If men of high degree and low degree are played in the balance, they are all together lighter than nothing. And I believe you have a verse there in the 8th chapter of 1 Corinthians. Verse 2, if any man think... When I started preaching, I was a young preacher, I just really wasn't ready to wait, and I jumped up in the pulpit and tried to preach and stuck my foot in my mouth so far I had the cleanest leg in the whole state. And I was a fool when I first started. If any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. When you think you know, you don't know anything. Verse 12 of chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians, Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth, take heed lest he fall. The word standeth, by the way, is the word histame. You think you're upright. Until God lets you realize what a low life that we are, we won't do anything right. Let's go back. Let me read this about Elisha to you. Let me read that again. Men's estimate of themselves is generally an inverse ratio of their qualifications. How few possessed of gifts are willing to wait the call of God like Elisha was doing? How few even without gifts... Sometimes we fool ourselves into thinking we have gifts. How few without gifts or else who imagine they have gifts, are willing to wait. Moses waited 40 years on the other side of the desert. He waited for the call of God. If God has a call for you, he will call you just like he did Elisha. It doesn't matter about your position. Don't say, but I've got this great education, and I'm so intelligent, I'm so smart, and I've got all these... Uh, I've got all of these qualifications. The greatest qualification is patience. You can't shepherd people. It seems to be forgotten. Listen to this. It seems to be forgotten that incapacity to serve God in a few things. It seems to be forgotten that incapacity, that inability to serve God in, quote, a few things. Matthew 25, 21. Look at this. Matthew 25, 21. Matthew. 
And this is what Elisha, Elisha was ministering to Elijah. He was washing his hands, and he was a nobleman. There's so many people. I've had young preachers come through here. I'm ready for you to teach me to preach. One guy come through. I'm ready for you to teach me to preach, Jim. What he meant is I'm ready for you to put me in the pulpit and film me on the, on the camera so I can get to be on TV. When a person is faithful and they stay and they stay and they stick and they stick and they stay and they stay and they never try to lift themselves up, I say, that's the man I look to the man that is faithful. That's the man that God looks to, and that's the man that God's going to trust. And the one that doesn't lift himself up and say that I know. Look here in Matthew 24. Look here, Matthew 24. Excuse me, 25 and verse 21. 25, 21. Speaking of the parable of the talents, his Lord said unto him, Well done, thy good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Few is the word oligos, O-L-I-G-O-S, and that word oligos means puny. If you ever are going to rule many, God doesn't need a king to start out on top. He doesn't need a preacher to start out on top of the world. He needs a man he can trust that'll do little things. I trust myself better since I've learned, since God has humbled me. I trust a man who will wash dishes and take out garbage. Because you know why? I had to get older before I would take out garbage and wash dishes, and I take out garbage every day. And I wash dishes, and I vacuum, and I sweep. If a man can't do the little puny things, that is not women's work. That's work. Period. If you can't do the little things year in and year out, and you can't be Elisha, and God has no Elijah to call you after. But if you'll notice, God didn't call Eli Elisha until he was through with the man of God. I've had a lot of young preachers come through here and say, well, it's time for me to preach, Jim, scoot over. I've had some people come in here and try to steal half the congregation, run off and say, Jim's not saying the truth and he doesn't know what he's doing and <coughs> God will use no man like that. And every time that happens, some guy will start some little group and it's okay to go out and preach. But say, let me steal the flock here and run off with them. That is not the faithfulness of God when you start passing judgment on the man of God. If you're faithful over a few things, I'll make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. We have to be faithful over the little things. And if you look over there in Galatians, the sixth chapter, I read it last week, but let me read it again. Look here. A lot of us would say, this is just too tiring. I'm too hard. It's too, it's too difficult, and I just get tired of pushing real hard. Look here in Galatians, the sixth chapter, one more time. One more time, Galatians 6. <clears throat> Verse 9, Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. The word faint is ekluo, E-K-L-U-O, E-K-L-U-O, and that word means to relax. If you don't relax and you continue in the work of God doing what you can do, that's when God will use you. Let me read a couple of more things about Elisha. I'm about out of time. I'm going to stay on Elisha. I'm going to bring some things in this book about him. It seems to be forgotten that incapacity to serve God in a few things. Nobody even talks about that. God's got a great work for me to be a great missionary in China or in Africa. What are you doing here in Andersville? Well, nothing. Well, he can't use you there if you can't be used here. And that he who cannot make it possible to be faithful in little may never be entrusted with that which is great, never. Here's a nobleman's son, the son of a nobleman, a prince. 
that should be ruling men. And he said, I will plow with the plow and wait for God. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They'll mount up with wings as eagles. They'll run and not be weary. They'll walk and not faint. The idea seems at least unconsciously to obtain that a certain position or certain circumstances are requisite in order... Now, listen to this. The idea seems in the world today, as well as during the time of Alfred Edersheim, he lived in the mid-1800s, he's saying the same things that I'm saying here. The idea seems at least unconsciously to obtain that a certain position or certain circumstances are requisite or they are required in order to serve God. You've got to have certain circumstances. That's what the world thinks, that somehow the active service of God must be incompatible with the ordinary duties of daily life. You understand what he's saying? People think that serving God is not in the ordinary duties of daily life. Let's look and see if Paul did that in Acts 18. Look at Acts 18. I like this man, Edersheim, more than I realized. Acts, 18th chapter, verse 1. And these things Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, because Paul was of the same craft, he didn't do drywall, he, did, he, he made tents. Because he was of same craft, he abode with them and wrought. The word wrought meant to have an occupation, for by their occupation they were tent makers, and Paul was making tents with them daily. He was a tent maker. Don't think you cannot serve God outside, outside of some kind of special situation. And if you look up there at verse 11, he went to Corinth. Look at verse, look down chapter, verse 8. Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his heart. And many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision, Be not afraid, but speak and hold not thy peace. For I am with thee, and no man shall set are thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city of Corinth. I have predestined many people here. And he continued there a year and six months working and making tents, teaching the Word of God among them. Let me read that one more time. Let me read that. The idea seems at least unconsciously to obtain that a certain position or certain circumstances are, re are re requisite in order to serve God, that somehow the active service of God must be incompatible with the ordinary duties of daily life, not according to Paul, or at any rate with such humble avocations as following the plow. <laughs> and Elisha was willing to follow the plow, and Paul was willing to make tents, and I've done everything in the world you can imagine, hauled hay while I was trying to preach. I've driven trucks while I was trying to preach. The opposite is the case, is what he says. There's a vast difference between worship and service. And he goes on. I hope we can understand that if you cannot serve God where you are, and you know what I used to do? I used to think, I've got great things to do for God. I think I'm a pretty smart guy. I need to move from uh, Fort Worth to Beaumont. Wait a minute. I need to move to Denver. Wait a minute. I need to run over here back to Dallas and Fort Worth. Great opportunities are in Memphis. Wait a minute. Here's some opportunities over here in Charlotte. Wait a minute. Back to Nashville. 
And I stopped one day and I said, what am I doing? Fertilize the ground where you are. The grass is never greener anywhere else. Be like Elisha. Wait and plow. Because if there's a man that shouldn't have been plowing as far as the world's viewpoint is concerned, it was Elisha. He was a nobleman's son. But he was plowing, waiting for God, and he was going to be the best friend that Elijah ever had. And Elijah was very lonely. If we cannot or do not serve God in the humble place and in daily duties which he has assigned us, assuredly, we, we never can nor will serve him in any place or circumstances. Let me read it again. If we cannot or do not serve God in the humble place, and in the daily duties which he has assigned us, assuredly we never can nor will serve him in any other place or circumstances. That religion must be spurious. It is false, which leads either to neglect or to a mean estimate of everyday duties, of the duties of home and the home circle, even if it were to exchange them for the excitement of a religious meeting, these are maybe means of refreshment, of fellowship, and of strengthening, strengthening. He's saying that's what the religious fellowship is. It's a strengthening place. It's a place of refreshment, but only to enable us to serve our Lord Jesus Christ in the humbler and more difficult ways and walks of everyday life. If we can't serve God there, he has no place for us anywhere. Don't be so quick to judge. Well, God hasn't got me doing great things. Settle down and wait. And when we wait upon God and prepare, some men come along and they say, I've got, I'm in a hurry. I'll try to steal half this congregation. God will not bless that at all. Wait on God. Read, let's read that last. Let's read that end of Acts 40. I mean, not Acts, uh, Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40, last couple of verses there. Isaiah 40. Last couple of verses. I'm going to get into Elisha because he's truly an inspiration to me about what we ought to be doing. Isaiah 40, verse 31. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength they shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Let's pray. Father, help us to wait. Lord, you've taught me as I've grown older to wait. I'm continuing to wait, but we know that doesn't mean to sit down. That means to busy oneself as we are waiting. And Lord, when we are preparing and we are faithful, you will have an Elijah in our lives to come along and drop the mantle upon us. Thank you for truth. Thank you for the conviction of your word. Forgive us of our sin and fight every battle. In Christ's name we pray, amen. That's practical truths. Let me see here. Let me mark this.